Cadence. Good evening and welcome. I'm Lynn Cadence and I'll be host for parts of the evening. And so let me give you a little roadmap for the night. Our esteemed authors for the evening, as you know, are Sharon Butella, Larissa Lai, Michelle Good, and Joanne McKay. In the first part of the evening, each author will tell you a bit about their book, read a short selection, and answer a few select questions. First, I'll interview Joanne McCaig about An Honest Woman. Then Joanne will interview Sharon Butella about Season of Fury and Wonder. Then I will interview Larissa Lai about Tiger Flu. And finally, Joanne will interview Michelle Good about Five Little Indians. Once the interview portion of the agenda is complete, we'll have a more intimate kind of freewheeling discussion about aging, reading, writing, and the pandemic. Michelle Good will be joining us a little bit late. She's speaking at another event about treaties, the terms of Indigenous permissions. First up, Joanne McCaig. Joanne McCaig taught English at the University of Calgary for 20 years. Her scholarly book, Reading In, Alice Monroe's Archives, was based on her doctoral research. Her first novel, The Textbook of the Rose, was shortlisted for the George Bunier Award and won the W.O. Mitchell City of Calgary Book Prize. She published her second novel, 2019, An Honest Woman. Honest Woman is a very bookish novel about places where writerly ambition collides with erotic desire. Joanne's bookishness finds further expression in her involvement with Broadview Press, Freehand Books, Thistledown Press, and the independent bookstore Shelf Life Books. Now I will invite Joanne to introduce the book a little and set up the scene she will then read. Joanne. Hi. Hi, everyone, and thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks for that intro. Um, yeah, so I'm going to um, read a little bit from An Honest Woman tonight. Um, An Honest Woman came out in 2019, October 2019, and it is, um, it's a metafictional novel in which I have um, sort of three different storylines. The storyline I'm going to read through, through uh, tonight is, uh, is Janet's storyline. So she's, uh, she's one of my characters. Um, Janet is a, is a writer and a woman going through menopause and ex finding the odd experience of having a drastic increase in libido associated with the disappearance of estrogen from her body. And uh, she's channeling this uh, odd experience into um, writing a novel. She's writing an erotic novel about a, a, a torrid love affair. But the torrid love affair is not only uh, sexual, it's also between two writers. Uh, she's fantasizing a, a, a love affair between a very well-established and well-known British writer and... Uh, an emerging Canadian woman writer named Jay. So the scene that I'm going to uh, read from has um, Janet's at home. And um, the odd thing about Janet's life is that she's immersed in this glorious, romantic, erotic uh, fantasy life, but that the life she's actually living involves work and dirty dishes and raising teenagers. So, um, yeah, so she mentions, I, I guess, yeah, she mentions two of her kids um, in the course of this reading. Matt is a teenager and uh, Eric is just a little guy. Hang on. Saturday night, Matt's AWOL and Eric's at the wave pool with the neighbors. Ah, the house to myself. But no, Matt and his friends return and the rumble of skateboard wheels on the wooden deck their harsh laughter and randy noise unsettle me, make me feel hunted. As usual, I seek sanctuary in my room. Then it occurs to me, it's Saturday night, Eric's safe, Matt's home, why do I need to stay here? So I leave, with minimal explanation and little planning. It's only after I order my green tea at the coffee shop that I realize I'm broke, that I've handed over all my bills to Eric for the pool. The nice man at the counter lets me have my tea anyway, though, for 76 cents. The banality of my existence just juxtaposed with these lush dreams. 
But how delicious, what happiness to be so immersed, so taken up, so carried away. I watch an elderly lady walk through the coffee bar, neat, shiny, gray hair, well cut, a trim figure, smooth skin. Over and over, I tell myself that I'm too old for all this yearning. It's ridiculous. This morning, more signs. A rich, I'm sorry, a white pearl of richly fertile mucus. If biology is destiny, it also has a weird sense of humor. Oh, I know how this madness ends. I invented a new scene this morning. I tried it out before writing it. Imagined it out, as Eric would say. The boys were still asleep, I hope. And this new scene is spectacular. Just a slight revision in which he has her prepared, secured, naked, and has asserted himself through a few small teasing touches. He licks his finger, and now he is ready, but still he takes his time. He undresses very slowly. Does he say that line now? It's such a great line. He stands silent at the foot of the bed, sipping his drink until she turns his, her head to look at him. Once he has her attention, he begins with a maddening lack of haste to undress. Then he says, a burst of laughter from the beautiful old lady across the room, talking with her friends. Across the street, a man is climbing a ladder to fix a roof, his slim hips moving smoothly and surely in faded jeans. The skateboarders are gone when I get home. Eric is in bed, happy and stinking of chlorine. There's a magazine in the bathroom tossed on the floor alongside Matt's boxers, socks, and t-shirt. I sit there, staring down at the back cover. At what appears to be an advertisement for socks. A very pretty blonde, naked, sits with her knees drawn up, hands draped just so, like the girl in that Ken Danby painting of the sunbather. This position allows the pretty young naked blonde not only to conceal her breasts and crotch, but also to display the socks she is wearing. On one side of the ad are three smaller photographs of the same young woman, headshots only. It takes me a while to interpret these smaller pictures as I sit on the can, gazing at the back cover of the skateboarding magazine. The woman's head is on a pillow. The woman's face shows various stages of sexual pleasure. I realize that the photographer pretty well has to be stuck right upper at the moment the photos were taken. Or at least that's the illusion intended. It shakes me then, this most private passion on display, feigned of course, but isn't that worse? In order to sell socks. The image is somehow far more obscene than the juicy spreads that I know Matt keeps hidden under the mattress in his room. And as I sit here, feeling a tawdry shadow following, sorry, and as I sit here, I feel a tawdry shadow falling over whatever joy I might steal from the strange fever that has overtaken me these days. Thanks for that. So Joanne, in your introduction, you mentioned metafiction and that plays a role in this book can you tell us why why you're interested in metafiction and what's happening here um i've, I've always loved metafiction it's, it's one of my favorite genres i um i find it really interesting and fun to 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 pay to pay attention to the fictionality of fiction and to interrogate uh, the assumptions that we make as fiction writers and fiction readers. Um, some of my some of my favorite novels are are metafictional. I love I love Carol Shields' Swan, a mystery. That's one of my favorite novels. I love Possession by A. S. Byatt, one of my favorites. And I also just like the way that um, metafiction doesn't doesn't allow readers to be passive and lazy. Uh, Readers, readers need, to, need to get involved in a work of, of metafiction and do, do some of the work of, uh, of making meaning. 
um, there was a, a, a piece went by on Facebook this morning from, from Zadie Smith, and it, it really resonated with me. Um, it's from her essay, um, Fail Better. She says, um, and I love Zadie Smith. Um, she says, a novel is a two-way street in which the labor required on either side is in the end equal. Reading done properly is every bit as tough as writing. I really believe that. As for those people who align reading with the essentially passive experience of watching television, they only wish to debase reading and writers. The phrase I know is um, that as readers, we co-create the book as we mm -hmm. go through. That there's this partnership, even though the institution isn't there in the moment. Does an honest woman have a feminist sensibility, would you say? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, pretty, um, that's, that's pretty fundamental to the book. Um, I have two appendices in the, in the novel, and one of them um, has, has our author um, sitting with a very important man of letters. And this, this man of letters is, is critiquing uh, her work. And, and, and he says some of the most outrageous things, you know, she's, she's trying to get an honest critique from this guy of her work. And he's saying things like, well, women don't know how to write about sex properly. You know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, Margaret Lawrence was really mean to men uh, in her work and, and those sorts of uh, outrageous things. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly, uh, it's a very feminist work. And, and all, all three of my narrators, there's three narrators in the book, all three of them are really strong women who, who, uh, who weren't fixated on a, on a man as the, as the solution to, to life's problems. They are, um, they're all pretty tough and, and independent women. So which parts were the most fun to write and which were the most difficult, would you say? It was, it was almost like they were both the same. Like it was really fun to say, fantasize winning an argument with Margaret Atwood, right? Like who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to, uh, you know, have, be having a disagreement with Mark, Margaret Atwood and come out on top. Like that, I must say, I did, I, I did a victory lap after, after I wrote that scene. But um, yeah, so it, it, was, it was fun to just um, okay. yeah. let anything happen. To let anything happen, you know, absolutely anything could happen. The, the most challenging part was, was keeping track of everything, keeping track of all the pieces. You know, I had to get all these little colored post-it notes and try to remember, I'm sorry, my dog's barking, but anyway, uh, try to remember who had, how, you know, who had three kids, who had two kids and, and so on. So it was some um, Keeping track of all the narrative strands was, was probably the, uh, the most challenging part. This is a perfect time for me to move on to conclude my, uh, my interview with Lynn and for me to interview Sharon. How would that be? So, I'm, Sharon, I'm going to read your bio and then I'm going to start asking you questions, okay? All right, I get to interview Sharon. Yay, okay. Um, Sharon Butala turned 80 in 2020, and her latest book, Season of Fury and Wonder, is about old age, the joy of success and the sting of shortcomings. Each story is a riff on a classic work of literature by the likes of Raymond Carver, Willa Cather, and Flannery O'Connor. Season of Fury and Wonder won the City of Calgary W.O. Mitchell Book Prize, and was shortlisted for the Rogers Writers Trust Prize for Fiction and the Georges Bounier Award for Fiction. It is Butala's 20th published book. Welcome, Sharon. Lovely to have you here. And uh, would you like to do a short reading for us? You bet. I'm glad to be here. And honestly, Joanne, listening to you talking about an honorable woman, I was thinking, oh, I wish I'd written that book. <laughs> the only trouble is I know I couldn't. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Too hard. <laughs> so, okay. My book is Season of Fury and Wonder, as Joanne said, and I'm going to do a five-minute reading. 
After a while, as one or the other of my women friends got sick in ways that would only get worse, so that our holidays dwindled and ceased, and as Alex was still out there on the acreage building birdhouses and keeping bees and whatnot, I began to think, why should the life of an old person be a poor copy of the life of a young one, as if to be an old person was merely to be a failed young one? And then I began to wonder what the life of an old person could be on its own, as if there had never been a young person with her ceaseless activity, her endless drama from excessive weeping to equally excessive excitement inside this wrinkled and shapeless exterior. I asked Alex on one of his increasingly infrequent visits. Interesting thought, he said. Let's see. If I were born the way I am now, if there were no young people in the world, only aged ones with their debilities and incapacities, they wouldn't be debilities and incapacities, we both said at once. They'd be normal, I added. We'd have to establish a whole new set of, I don't know, purposes. He said, what are your purposes when you're young? Mostly just to be happy, answering himself. But to be happy when you're young means finding a partner, getting an education, and then a job, being successful, and so on. Only the happy one still applies in old age, I said. Happy? No, I don't think so. What are you talking about, I said. Define happy. Let's not be ridiculous, he said. I bristled, patriarchal scum, bitch, crone, hag, he said to me. We could carry on in this manner for a good five minutes and often had, but this time we agreed to both shut up and eat our dinners before they got cold. He had once told me in all seriousness that I was becoming a witch. In the old-fashioned sense, he hastened to point out, I inquired as to his meaning. Someone who can see into the future and make prophecies, he told me. Someone who can see the spirit world before she joins it. I laughed at him and changed the subject, although even then I could feel it coming true. But it doesn't have to do to have such a reputation. They don't burn you at the stake anymore. They just lock you up in an asylum, or else they drug you so heavily you might as well be locked up or dead. I used to have friends who called themselves witches and who met in covens where they stood around in circles chanting and lighting candles and waving around sticks of incense. They were alert enough to know that I have some natural facility for the spirit world that they were always going on about. But whenever they asked me to join them, I laughed at them, always being careful to deny that I had any such abilities. Calgary's a terrible city for witchcraft, I used to tell them. It's too commercialized and money-loving. Go to Victoria. I hear there are lots of your kind there. I had a friend who told me she had moved away from Victoria for that very reason, because random witches floating around the city had picked up on her vibes as a sensitive and kept knocking on her door. Perfect strangers, she told me, and asking her to join them, and she had gotten very sick of the whole business and moved to Kelowna. Later, uh, as Alex and I were lounging on the sofa in front of my fake fireplace, fake because no wood, coal, or ashes are involved, he said, of course, that could never happen because where would the babies come from? If we didn't have happy, what would we have? What we have now, hanging around, waiting for the axe to fall. Honestly, I said, for a smart man, you say dumb things. Nobody can solve this problem, he said in something that my have, might, I might have called an anguished tone, when you can't make babies and you can't work and you're not interested in curling, bowling, skydiving, traveling, or scrapbooking, what the hell are you going to do? Read, I said, study, think, walk in nature. Well, that's original. What could I do but sigh? Because, of course, he was right. There are things that it is impossible to learn when you are young, no matter how much you read and study. I could feel him turning his head to look at me. He was still a handsome man, even at 80. But I thought, so what? I'll give you that, he said at last, and we both sat, staring into the gas-fueled fire. That might have been the last time he stayed over, but of course by then we would sleep in separate rooms or else lay side by side in my big bed that I never rid myself of since Ed died, though I often thought of it maybe holding hands, or he might touch my face with his fingertips inquiringly, as it were. I'm well, 
I would whisper, and he would breathe gently in through his nose and turn on his side, away from me, companionably, as if we'd been married for many years and loved each other in a way the young know nothing about. Why do people not think that is a good way to be? Oh, that was wonderful, Sharon. Thank you. Um, you uh, I, I picked out three of my favorite things in this story, and you, you, you read one of the lines uh, that uh, addresses one of those favorite things. I love the humor in this story. Um, I was lying on the couch rereading the story um, on Sunday, and I came to the line about Alex. He was still a handsome man, even at 80, but I thought, so what? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I was lying on the couch and I burst out laughing and I, I upset my dog. My, I, my, my dog is old too and she looked very soundly. And I was just hooting with laughter and she kind of lifted her head up and went like, what's your problem? But uh, so, so just in terms of the theme of the evening, uh, how useful or important is it to keep one's sense of humor as one ages? Well, I, I really think it's pretty darned important, but, uh, well, I think, you know, when you see old women together, they're usually laughing, aren't they? Uh, you know, unless they're consoling one another because someone has lost her, her husband or partner or whatever. Um, uh, so, you know, of course it's important, but it's pretty hard to do because as any aged person will tell you, you've got an awful lot that you have to deal with and that the... Um, the future is the one thing you don't have anymore. Uh, and that means you have to readjust your way of thinking about the world and the way of thinking about who you are in the world. And that's not really that amusing. No, no. Well, the, I, so, so the second aspect I zoned in on in my rereading was the wisdom. So this narrator has terrific amounts of common sense. And one of the things that struck me since I personally am struggling with the fact that my three adult sons never write and never call, <laughs> your, narrator, uh, your narrator says she has succeed, succeeded in moving her son from the forefront of her mind so that his absence from her life no longer causes her such suffering. And I thought that was, that was such um, a wise and, and admirable thing. So, and, and it leads me to, to the question of like, do you think that one of the gifts of aging is, is that we, I mean, as you were just saying, we are, we are, it behooves us to adjust our expectations of other people and of our especially future. Especially those, yes. yeah, and especially of those younger than us, the things that, uh, that cause us such pain is, is usually the negligence of our children. Uh, uh, you know, and I know there are hundreds of women out there who will say, I don't know what you're talking about, but most of the people I know would, would say that. So that's what's happened. And worse, as one of my friends who's my age was saying to me over the phone just the other day, when I think back to how I treated my mother, I am so sorry that now that my kids don't phone me when I think they should. I'm so sorry that I didn't phone her more often, even after I knew she was dying, you know, after she got the, the diagnosis, she was still a fairly young woman. And she said, I didn't, even then, I didn't do the things I could have done. And I often think, you know, no mother wants to blame her kids. I only have one, I have a son in Toronto with a wife and kids. Um, no mother wants to, you know, be really hard on her grown children because I always, what I always do is I always think about myself at that age. I think, let me see, when I was in my 50s, where was I? What was I doing? What was I thinking about my mother and my father? You know, and they were not at the top of my list of things I had to attend to. It, it was more a case yes, of my yes. husband, you know, and so on. So I try to be reasonable. Uh, and I think I'm extremely grateful. Nowadays, my son gives me a call practically once a week, which is a lot for a man who's nearing 60, right? <laughs> yeah, it makes me very jealous. 
Um, so my last question is, is, is about, well, it was about sort of the mystery or mysticism or connection to the, to the spirit world in this narrator and also several other narrators in the book. Another one of my favorite stories um, in the collection is what else we talk about when we talk about love, right? Right. But um, in, in Soothsayer, um, the narrator seems to, to be sort of, um, I don't know, hooked into the, uh, to, into the mystery, into, into, the, into things unseen. And um, I don't know, I, I was wondering if, if you chose to read this story um, because of, be, because, because I, um, a, a subset of the things we're talking about is the pandemic. So I was wondering if you chose this story because of, of, the, of the pandemic, that this woman is a soothsayer and the scene with the wolf at the end and the, and the notion that, um, you know, it's here. This is the end times are beginning. Is that partially why you thought soothsayer would be what you wanted to read from tonight? No, um... I think it was the questions Lynn asked me that got me interested in, well, I said I could read that part and that was the end of it. I just read it. It wasn't because I started thinking of Soothsayer. I always read the same thing, which is Grace's Garden. Um, I uh, wrote that story. It was completely written and finished before the pandemic started. But what's so interesting about it was that it does in itself entail a prophecy. It opens with the raven on the roof of her house, which is an, an exact description of what happened to me. And uh, being, uh, I had to give my character reason to pursue um, mythology and so on, stories about the raven and who the raven is. And when you see something as horrifying and startling as that, it can't be without meaning in the universe. You think that once you get old enough, you know. Uh, and in doing that, so I made my character's son, grown son, a comparative anthropologist or something I can't even remember now, but a, an expert in all of these matters. And that as he drew further and further away from her, one of her ways of keeping in touch was by reading the uh, papers that he published on various subjects like this one, which is how she knows all about various mythologies and symbology and so on. So at the end, if I tell you this, I will probably be hauled away and that'll be the end of my part in the show but in fact one early one Sunday morning I was walking down um, a, a fairly wild path and I was alone there was no one around because it was early and I looked back and I saw this animal which turned out to be a wolf struggle its way out of the base of a tree and I didn't think anything of it I just thought hmm wolf and, the, and then I began to think as she does in the story well there are no wolves here that couldn't have happened I must have been dreaming or something but then in pursuing uh, mythology she discovers the wolf Fenrir or Fenris who was um, uh, tied up by the gods because the story was that if he got free he would swallow the sun which means the end of times and I just watched that wolf calmly trot down the path away from me, and I kept on going home. And then once I put it all together, you know, the next thing that happened was a certain American president got elected, and everything fell apart, and then we all fell into the COVID thing, and we're just now kind of struggling our way out. So I'm going on much too long. So what can I say? It's part true. It's part invented. It's part fantasy um i'm just interested in those things and i'm now old enough that i figure what can anybody do to me <laughs> if you know if i tell the truth about some of my experiences it's too late nobody cares so so now i'm being truthful <laughs> yeah Oh, Sharon, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for season of Fury and Wonder, and thank you for this uh, this interview. This was wonderful. Thank you too. Thank
Thanks a lot. Now I'm yes, trying to. <laughs> That's great. So next up, Larissa Lai of Hong Kong Chinese descent, poet, critic, novelist. Larissa Lai has written eight books, including The Tiger Flu. Tiger Flu is a speculative fiction novel in which a woman over 50 is responsible for the reproductive continuity of her community. Involved in cultural organizing, experimental poetry, and speculative fiction communities since the late 1980s, Larissa has received the Duggins Prize, the Lambda Award, the Astra Award, and been shortlisted twice for the City of Calgary W.O. Mitchell Award. She holds a Canada Research Chair at the University of Calgary, where she directs the Insurgents Architects House for Creative Writing. The Tiger Flu is, it's set in a few barely recognizable Canadian cities, most of the year, mostly set in the year 2145, a year also measured in time after oil. Climate change is evident, and there is a pandemic, a flu, which affects more men than women. The story is sort of epic in scope. It's difficult to describe in these two sentences. So I will ask Larissa, can you tell us a little bit more, and can you introduce the piece you're about to read, and then read your selection from the Tiger Flu? Larissa. Sure. sure. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for having me on. Um, you did a pretty good job of describing it. I'm not sure that I could um, add much to that without getting really involved. So maybe I'll, I'll just I'll just jump in. I mean, yeah, what do you need to know? It's indeed set in the near future uh, in, in the Western parts of Turtle Island. Um, much of it takes place in a city called Saltwater City, which is the old name, the old Chinese name for, um, for Vancouver. Um, and there are two narrating voices. One is um, a young woman uh, growing up in that city whose family are, are falling um, sort of perilously ill and decisions need to be made about her future. And then the second one is the one I'm gonna read from. She is a, no, I won't tell you because it will unfold in the, in the section I'm gonna read who and what she is better than if I just sort of describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, so her name is Kirilo Groundsel. This is my narrator. She's young. She's, she's only 19. Um, but I chose this selection because um, a couple of the, the older characters appear um, in this chapter. And um, yeah, you'll get a, a little bit of a sense of how motherhood unravels um, in this somewhat strange world. So the chapter is called The Starfish Groom. Even if she is our last doubler, I don't want Auntie Radix to have Peristrophe Halliana's eyes. Auntie Radix already took Peristrophe Halliana's liver a week ago and one of her kidneys four weeks before that. Auntie Radix says that it is the duty and nature of a starfish to give. I tell her it is the duty and nature of a doubler to know when to stop asking. Peristrophe Halliana and I have seen the new monsoons only 19 times each. We are barely old enough to do what we do. Auntie Radix has been drenched by the rains 48 times. It should be her job to sacrifice for us and not the other way round. It's a good thing that memory is not a part of the body that can be cut out, or no doubt she would ask for Peristrophe Halliana's memory too. I bite back my resentment. Radix Bupluri is our queen, not to mention the eldest of the 83 sisters who live at Grist Village and a direct descendant of Grandma Chen Ling. She is well past a healthy age for childbearing, but she is still our last doubler. With our death rates, we Grist sisters go the way of the dodo, unless she keeps birthing puppies. Yes, from her midnight egg space and pop, out her who, once plump and fresh, now floppy as an old sock. Still juicy to her young groom who loves her. For me, nothing about her is juicy. Everything is duty. That means grit and grin through every whim and tantrum. I sigh. I clean then sharpen my knives on my precious whetstone. 
Don't you know that diamonds are a girl's best friend? We made the whetstone ourselves, crushed so many engagement rings from skeletons of the time before, six glass towers full of nice ladies, sweet, so sweet. Purdy, the scavenger aunties tell me. Purdy as cover girl, wonderful wonder bra. Yes, by George Marciano. Purdy and thin as skin and bones. They had time to work off the weight. Time to rot, time to mummify. For every season, there is a reason. Off their skinny dead fingers, the scavenger aunties took their diamonds, crushed those doggies to a coarse salt, and made me my whetstone. Now I smooth my blade. One, two, three. All that love from the time before rushes into my shiv. That's the way the cookie crumbles, I tell my beloved peristrophe Heliana as I work my knives. Once they are good and sharp, I wipe them down with mother moonshine. We make it ourselves in clawfoot tubs from the time before with potatoes cropped from our own fields. You know, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? We pretty maids, we sister grist, some call us tub puppets, fuck moppets, matchstick monkeys. Who cares? We will outlive them all in beds of our own making. As I prepare my knives, I rant the chant the grannies gave me, the one that Grandma Chunling heard from the dirt so long ago. My mother double, glory bind groundsel, smoking medicinal marijuana in the old rosewood pipe she inherited from Grandma Chunling herself, chants with me to make sure I get the words right. She teaches me my genealogy, you know, like where we came from, what we're here for. You must hold these things, Kirilo, she tells me. We hold all that remains of the old world's knowledge in our raw brains. That means we need to be extra smart. She teaches me how to be a good groom to my beloved peristrophe Heliana, the last starfish among us, the last giver. It isn't easy, you know, to have and to hold, to kiss and to cut. Slit sluts, that's what they call us in Saltwater City. I'm not ignorant, I know what they say. It's why they expelled our grannies 80 years ago, for having and holding, for slicing and stitching. What did they expect from us anyhow? That they could keep making us again and again and again? Bust us from their greasy bottles like so many cheap jean genies? As if. Grandma Chunling invented the parthopop. You know, how we egg ourselves along. I mean the long lizardy love of the Grist sisters. We split, we slit, we heal, we groom. Self-mutated beyond the know-how of the clone company Gemini that spawned us and the host scale and microchip factories that bought our grannies to work for them. But there are flaws in our limited DNA, the DNA of just one woman. We mutate for better or worse, for sickness or health, but more for sickness and worse. Only our starfish can save us by regrowing whatever grooms like me cut out of them. Grandma Chunling invented the kiss cut, the repair job, what do you say, the fix, the patch. The first starfish gave her liver, her kidneys, and at last her red hot heart to the first doubler. And so it was in the beginning. Just a little bit of that strange thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So it's not surprising, I suppose, that what interests me about this book today is why were you writing about a pandemic before this pandemic? You know, what were you thinking? And how, what was the genesis of this story? And, and then I'll ask you what you're thinking about it now, but what was the genesis of the story and how did you create it? Sure. Thanks, Lynn. It's a, it's a great question. So this novel was very, very long in the writing because of, um, well, for a number of reasons, very, very long in the writing. I started it in 2003. So the initial genesis of the novel was another pandemic, which was um, the SARS crisis in, in 2003. Um, I was traveling. I was in Hong Kong 
I had been invited to the Hong Kong International Writers Festival, which just by chance took place about a week after that first case of SARS um, was discovered um, at the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. And uh, there was a lot of coverage here in the Canadian press, but the coverage was so racist that I didn't think the pandemic was real. And um, so Rita and I just, we went anyway. And of course, landing in Hong Kong discovered quite quickly that, um, that the pandemic was in fact quite, quite real and um, that two things can be true at once, you know, that the coverage can be racist and the pandemic can exist. Um, so I was very struck by, um, by my experience of the city on that, on that particular trip. My roots are there. I know the city sort of not hugely well, you know, having lived here for, um, for pretty much all my life. Um, but I did know that Hong Kong was supposed to be a lot more crowded than that, a lot noisier, a lot more bustling. And it was just, it was just Deadsville because um, everybody got that there was, you know, this, um, this, this frightening um, disease running rampant in the city. And so, you know, at the Writers' Festival, Rita and I ended up um, sitting on way more panels than we were supposed to because so many of the writers uh, had canceled at the last minute, um, probably eight or 10 panels in one festival, which is unheard of. Um, so yeah, so I mean, after that, it just sort of, the experience of being there in that strange time, seeing how people, people who look like me um, were dealing with such a thing, I think gave me a little bit of a, well, first of all, it was very unsettling. So it, you know, it gnawed at me and it was something that I wanted to write about and did write about in, in all of the subsequent years. Um, it was also a very difficult novel to write because, because I imagined a very, very large world. And um, it took many, many drafts to make it, uh, to make it a functional novel. So it was, it was a, a piece of sort of strange, um, I suppose we could call it a kind of dark serendipity that, um, that it was published uh, just before the pandemic that, that has in fact hit us. Mm -hmm. So you don't think of it as prophecy or you haven't, um, have you been accused? Yes. It's not that I don't think of it as prophecy, you know, like in the wake of our, our prep and a few other um, interviewees have asked me this question as well. And, you know, I think one way of thinking about it is, I, I mean, I don't think that there's anything magical or like lightning bolts out of the blue that makes yeah. it, that makes it prescient. But I do think about, you know, the way in which the kind of life that this particular, um, the, the kind of life that I've received on this, on this particular incarnation um, is one in which I, I think I have a, a consciousness that is at least double, if not triple. And you'll hear, hear a lot of um, BIPOC folks talk about this, about, you know, having to be able to pay attention to at least two ways of being, if not more than two, um, as a matter of survival, as a matter of making sense of the world. Um, and I think there's also something, you know, about the way I and my family have come through that um, in order to survive, one has to pay attention to a range of global forces at work all the time and have a fair bit of um, canniness around um, the kinds of possible interactions that might come out of um, uh, the collision of forces. And so perhaps that is a kind of, of, of prescience. Uh, perhaps prescience is, you know, mm -hmm. double consciousness, us a capacity to pay attention combined with forward directed thinking, which of course, if one is, is thinking of future generations, one does. And, and maybe that's all it is because in, in, a, in many ways, this novel, you know, sort of seems to me, I experience the writing of it as just being a little bit observant and then doing a little bit of extrapolation. I, you know, I don't think of myself as someone with magical so powers of any The novel, having been through the pandemic, or do you think about it differently? Do I think about the Has the pandemic taught you things about your book, changed your ideas about, about what you were thinking before? Um, I mean, I think that the way that I've experienced the pandemic, like there are certain things 
you know, that I didn't, I didn't foresee the world of the novel that I imagined is much more catastrophic. I mean, I'm not saying that we aren't living through quite a catastrophic moment. I think it's set further in the future, of course. It's set, it's set further in the future. And I mean, it is sort of, it is written as a, as a, you know, as a spec fiction novel. So it, it, it requires these sort of fairly intense conflicts that are not in, unfolding quite in the same way, although we are having our fair share of it. So, I mean, there are certain things like I did, you know, I did imagine in advance, but many of us could have seen these coming, you know, the, the, um, the arrival of a, of a, of a, of, fasc of, a, of a return to, of, to fascist politics. I did imagine that. I did Im imagine an intensification of our lives online, although the way it's imagined in the book is a little bit different from our lives on Zoom. Um, but that, that sense of needing to, um, yeah, of going to the digital, digital world as a way of surviving appears in the novel. Um, mm -hmm. I did imagine, um, you know, a shifting of, of social relations. The world hasn't shifted in quite the same way that I imagined, but the imagination of a shift is there. I think the things that I didn't imagine though, were, you know, the intensity of the isolation that we, we've been inhabiting for this past year. Right. Yeah, which I didn't, that wasn't something I really thought about. Uh, actually, that's not true. There are figures in the novel as well that are deeply isolated and having to deal with isolation because of shifting social conditions that, because they lose people to the, to the, to the pandemic and the tiger flu. Um, and that loss pushes them to become other than they were before the arrival of the pandemic. I'm pretty sure that's happening to us now as well. I don't know how, I don't know if I could, can describe yet what we've lived through, but I do feel myself to be different and I'm sure many of us do. Yeah. Well, you've got 15 minutes or so to think about that because we're going to come back to you <laughs> and ask you what you've been through the pandemic and what you're thinking about now. So I'll turn it back to Joanne for her interview. Okay, and Michelle, I did I did scroll through and see that you're there, so do unmute yourself. It's my uh, privilege now to interview Michelle Good. Um, Michelle Good is of Cree ancestry, a descendant of the Battle River Cree, and a member of the Red Pheasant Cree Nation. She has worked with Indigenous organizations since she was a teenager, and at 40, decided to approach that work in a different way obtaining her law degree from UBC at 43. She has practiced law in the public and private sector since then, primarily advocating for residential school survivors. Her first novel, Five Little Indians, won the HarperCollins UBC Best New Fiction Prize, and her poetry has been included in Best Canadian Poetry in Canada 2016, and Best of the Best Canadian Poetry in Canada 2017. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you, there you are. Good. Okay. I wanted to make sure you were All right. Um, I, Michelle, I, would, you, <laughs> would, would you like to read a passage from Five Little Indians for us, please? Yeah, sure I will. Um, I'll maybe just uh, say a little something about the book. Generally, it's... Um, this is a book about five survivors of residential school, and it isn't so much about their experiences in the school or their time in the school. It's more about um, the challenges that they faced when they left the school without any kinds of supports, any proper training, and just trying to make a life like so many Indigenous people have. Um, my mother is a residential school survivor, as was my grandmother, and all of my aunties and uncles and friends and my cohort that I worked with. And um, so I developed these characters um, based on the stories that I've heard all the live long day, so to speak. Um, this section that I'm going to read uh, involves one of the five main characters, uh, Clara. And she has just come back from the US. She became involved in the American Indian movement and was injured and some of her friends have brought her to stay with a healing person, a woman who is a healer and an elder. And uh, um, Clara is dealing with um, 
the challenge that many Indigenous people came after being told in these church-run schools that their own spirituality is devil worship and evil and that they're going to burn in hell and all of that kind of stuff. And so Clara is sort of being introduced to traditional ways and um, and this is sort of about, this section is about her challenges that she experiences in that way. So they're off in the Cypress Hills in a little cabin with Mariah and Clara. The winter set in slow and vengeful, sucking all warmth from the air. Within a couple of weeks, Mariah and Clara slipped into a comfortable routine. Mariah cooked and was thankful that Clara kept the wood box full. Sometimes on clear days, Mariah would take Clara out on her trap line. She, she showed Clara the fine art of tying snares and dispatching rabbits as kindly as possible. Whenever they found one in a snare, Mariah would reach into the pouch tied around her waist, put down tobacco with soft Cree words, and then knock it over the head, efficiently, even lovingly. She taught Clara the unique way of skinning a rabbit, much like taking off a sweater, once the cuts were made on the extremities. Clara would get dizzy sometimes as she watched Mariah dress the rabbits, thinking back to Indian school and how Sister Mary would have knocked her on the head if she saw a return to such savagery. It pleased Clara thinking of that evil woman and how she would see her Christian mission as failed, seeing Clara in the hands of this pagan. After a while, Clara got used to a group of people who came to the cabin to join Mariah in the lodge, sweat lodge. Uh, there was a regular core group as well as some that came just every now and then. Mariah never extended her invitation to Clara again, but Clara knew the lodge was always open to her. After dark, when the songs rising in the air signaled that the door was closed, Clara would bundle up as warmly as possible and sneak down towards the lodge. Just before the pathway widened into the clearing, she would huddle halfway between an old poplar and listen, or behind an old poplar, and listen to the singing. It was kind of like the drumming she'd heard at the friendship centers, but different at the same time. Sometimes she felt a power rising in those songs that would leave her in a panic she really didn't understand. Mariah was a good woman that Clara knew without a doubt. Clara knew this without a doubt but it terrified her anyway, and inevitably it was Sister Mary and her threats of eternal damnation that chased her back up the pathway to the cabin. One night, breathless from her gallop up the snowy hill, Clara stood outside the porch, brushing the snow off her clothes and kicking it off her boots. John Lennon stood with his paws on the sill of the porch window, ears up, smiling at her. As clean of snow as possible, she went into the porch, stripped off her gear, and stuffed it in a corner beside the wood box. She tickled John Lennon behind the ears and went into the cabin to wash in the warm water from the wood stove reservoir, trying to take the chill pink out of her face before Mariah and the rest came back. Clara was laying out the feast food in the way Mariah had taught her when the first of the group made their way back into the cabin. Mariah looked at her and smiled knowingly. Damn that woman, Clara thought, can't get anything over on her. Clara, could you please prepare the offering and take it down to the lodge? Clara could feel her face tightening. Do I have to? Everyone in the room was momentarily motionless, aghast, but wordless. Again, or Aggie, one of the young women, walked over to Clara by the feast table and picked up a small plate and handed it to her. It's an honor to offer the food to the ancestors. Come on, I'll help you. Clara took a tiny sampling of everything on the feast table as she had seen others do before. Simple food, bannock, soup, a pie, fruit, dried meat, tea, but always game meat, berries, corn, and candy. Aggie added another piece of candy. The ancestors love sweets, she said. Clara walked behind Aggie on the trail to the lodge, the plate of food in her hand. Aggie stood next to the fire in front of the lodge and nodded toward her. So what do I do? The irritation in Clara rose. How was she supposed to know? Aggie handed Clara a pinch of tobacco and motioned towards the fire. Say a prayer of thanks and offer the tobacco and the food to the fire. Things we burn in a sacred fire go to the other side for the ones gone ahead of us. 
Clara pressed the plate into her hands, her anger rising. You give thanks. She turned and walked back to the cabin. Mariah didn't even look at Clara when she walked in alone. Aggie came in a few minutes later, equally silent. Mariah, is it okay if I say the prayer for the feast tonight? Aggie asked, stepping towards the table and reaching for the braid of sweetgrass. Of course. Clara walked out onto the porch and sat in the big chair, the fire warm. John Lennon lay down at her feet. She could still hear Aggie. She thanked practically every, everything under the sun, and while Clara wanted to dismiss it as silly, as she heard her say she was thankful for life and the things that give life, she could feel tears rising, but choked them back, thinking of Sister Mary and her handy strap. The next morning, Clara walked Mariah's trap line alone. It was as though the sun had thrown handfuls of diamonds on the crusty snow. John Lennon robbed out of sight and she was left alone in the brilliant sunlight, thankful this day for the empty snares. She stopped, the stillness of the morning making the sound of her feet on the snow unbearable. She looked through the skeletal black boughs of the poplar, so dark against the cloudless sky, the tinkling of the bottles filling the air with such a wistful sound that she felt small again. She looked up to the few remaining leaves of those poplar and birch trees, and they were accompanied by a different singing, a singing her childlike spirit knew to be the angels, the ancestors, <clears throat> shining down on her. She hated them. After she had prayed and prayed for Lily, she died anyway, and she hated them for it as much as she hated Sister Mary for making Lily work so hard when she was so sick. How could there be angels or ancestors that would allow little kids to be broken and destroyed? Life is a mystery, Clara. Clara was so startled by the voice, she jumped and ran into the bush beside the trail. Mariah! It was as though she was reading her thoughts. Don't scare me like that. John Lennon came running back from his adventure at a full gallop, sliding to a halt at her feet, smiling at the two women. Mariah laughed. Didn't you hear me coming? No, I was thinking, Clara flushed with embarrassment. I can feel how you suffer. My shoulder's almost better. It hardly hurts at all now, thanks to you. You know what I mean. Leave me alone, Mariah. I survived my own way. Clara turned and headed back to the cabin, stomping through the snow. She could hear Mariah's voice behind her. There's more to life than surviving, child. I'm not a child. Clara immediately felt silly about her childish reply. John Lennon loped behind her as she headed towards the woodpile. She made, she made four trips, each time neatly stacking the wood in the boxes on the porch and by the kitchen stove. Usually work like this pushed the images of Lily out of her head, but this day her memory persisted. Lily's frail body racked with coughing, the blue of her lips offset by the pink bubbles that formed with every cough. Lily, I should have stood up for you more. I should have stood between you and her and refused to take you out into the cold. Lily, who's Lily? It was only then that Clara realized she was speaking aloud as she stacked the poplar rounds in the wood box. My friend, she was my friend. And then she broke. After years of silent remembrance of her little friend and her lonely death, Clara had never spoken of her other than briefly to George and was convinced her death was as much her fault as sisters. Where were they then, Mariah? Where were your ancestors when they killed her? Who killed her, Clara? Sister, sister killed her. Clara told her about Indian school and how Lily had hemorrhaged to the brink of death in front of her, how Sister Mary had let her die alone and helpless. She told Mariah of her angels, the ones who would sing for her from the highest leaves of the birch trees back home. She told her of how the spirits had touched her in those early days of her childhood and how they had abandoned her completely in the barren hills of the Indi halls of the Indian school. Clara cried and cried for Lily, for herself, for her lost angels. It seemed as though hours had passed and still she cried. Mariah sitting quietly by her side. We were children, me and Lily, and neither of us survived, even though I'm still walking. That evening, that evening, Mariah fed her clear soup and put her to bed 
as though she were a child tucking her in warm. And within minutes, Clara felt herself fall into a deep, exhausted slumber. She thought she was dreaming when she saw Mariah lead John Lennon to her bedside. The following morning, there was tea on the stove, but Mariah was nowhere to be seen. Clara sat up in bed, tucked her feet in John Lennon's coat, resting them lightly on his back. He thumped his tail. Clara was long finished her tea when Mariah returned. I've prepared the lodge. Will you come with me? They walked together, Mariah and Clara, down the crisp pathway under a pale sun. The fire burned high and Clara watched as Mariah entered the lodge, seated herself, and looked out the doorway, arm extended, welcoming her. Clara crouched, took her hand, and crossed the threshold. There are no English words to describe how one, one woman walked into the lodge and another walked out. All Clara knew was that it took her back. Back to the birch grove and the angel songs, back to who she was before Sister Mary, before the school, before they tried to beat her into a little brown white girl. She felt a certainty from then on that all the ones who had come before walked with her. Life was no longer just survival. It was about being someone, an Indian someone with all the truth that was born into her at the moment she was placed in her mother's womb. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, if, if you hadn't read uh, that last paragraph, I was going to ask you to read it because it is my favorite uh, paragraph in the book. The one that begins, there are no English words to describe how one woman walked into that lodge and another walked out. It's just, uh, it's so beautiful. So I'm so glad you chose to read that, that part. Um, yeah. Almost anything I have to say now is sort of it seems superfluous, but um, um, one of the topics of our panel this evening is aging, and certainly uh, Mariah, as an elder, is um, is very important uh, in the story. I did notice in an earlier section of Clara's when Clara throws a rock through the the, the hotel window and she ends up in the drunk tank. Mm -hmm. There's a little old lady in there. Mm -hmm. There's and and I, I read about her. There's a little old lady in the drunk tank, and she speaks to Clara about creation. Yes. And points out a birch tree, right? And says, the power of creation is everywhere. And, yes. and, and when I read this, I thought, is that a real little old lady? Or is that in Clara's imagination or is there another I, 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 or to the point is there another yeah. alternative? you know is there an alternative yes. that she is someone that is neither in imagination and not in the jail cell and uh, that's the answer so and interestingly the birch tree is indigenous to Canada the maple tree is not and so that's why birch is a theme throughout and there's a lot of medicines traditional medicines that come from the birch tree. So that's why you see the birch tree. And, and somebody, you know, would read that section that you're referring to. When <laughs> and Clara, she just, uh, for those of you who haven't read, read the book, she went to work where a lot of the other young women of her that went to the same school went to work in a motel as a chambermaid. And uh, she gets fired for beating up the manager. <laughs> And uh, he deserved it. And, um, and then she goes back and she's sitting on the bench outside the hotel or the motel and thinking about Lily. And Lily was a character, this is the one who died of tuberculosis, based on um, one of my mother's friends who hemorrhaged to death on the playground. And so there's lots of stories that I've incorporated in here in one way or another that are that are based in not just a, not just a representation of the truth and uh, and that's one of them and Clara is a person who as a little wee child is exposed to a 
a spiritual experience and it's ultimately a return to that that saves her and the woman that's uh, in the jail cell is a spirit it's not in her imagination and is not a hallucination and it's not physically there but she's she is the spirit of the ancestors who's telling her look you know even in this horrible place look at that little tree right and you know and look at the power of creation that's in all of us that's in everybody right so yeah yeah the hopeful aspects of the book is 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 your suggestion that uh, that no matter what um the wisdom keepers are are still among us whether in spirit form or or real form and that um that 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 wisdom hasn't been lost well and it's and it's true and i wouldn't first of all i wouldn't call it legend and lore i'd call it traditional indigenous knowledge <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, our wisdom has been reduced to, you know, myth, lore, legend, uh, to suggest, you know, that there isn't any weight or, or strength to it. Um, but one of the things that I, in at least two of uh, the characters, I characterize when they go home and how difficult it is to repair familial relationships when you've been gone for 10 years from the time you're you know five or six years old till you're 16 years old when you can you can le you could legally then be released from the schools and you know the very real damage that has been done by um, fulfilling the colonial agenda which was to and i quote separate the child from the wigwam and uh, just the way that you would understand things is it's reflective of a completely different worldview. And so when you destroy language, you destroy a worldview. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the lightning rounds of a slightly more intimate conversation, uh, more personal conversation. Sharon, can you unmute yourself and tell us how has your pandemic year been? How has life changed and what's been happening? Well, as I've been telling people, um, my first reaction is, was a kind of a relief because um, I don't find myself to be very comfortable when I'm out in society, much as I like society and all the rest of it. I always, and now that I'm so old, um, many of the places that I go, everybody else is way younger and that puts a distance I find, or at least I feel it. So I stay home a lot. And when I'm staying home and know everybody else is too, then I don't worry about it so much. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, I have spent the last 40-some years as a writer, and that means reading, 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 and reading some more, and working two to six or seven hours a day at my computer typing. And uh, so I didn't lose as much as other people did, you know, to start with. But even when it began to weigh on me, um, when that period when it, the whole world was locked in their house for two weeks, um, I began to sort of move in a different way through time. That was very um, amazing to me and uh, a little bit scary. I, I, I fear losing civilization. So, um, I did a lot of work. I learned a lot of things. I read a lot of book, uh, books, and I wrote a whole book. So, hey, what the heck? What were you working on? Uh, well, I had this notion come into my head one day of a scene, just a scene. Uh, and I couldn't, you know, I just thought, well, that's got nothing to do with me. I don't write that kind of book. And it wouldn't go away, and it wouldn't go away. So then I thought, well, it's not like I've got something else to do. So I tried to figure out how we could come to that scene. It took, so I just started typing. It took me 100 pages to get to that scene. So that was part one of the book. And then 
I had another 150 or more pages to, you know, the consequences and sorting out the problems and then the, the you know, denouement and ending it, which I have succeeded in uh -huh. doing. <laughs> Bravo. How about you, Joanne? Can you unmute yourself and tell us? Yeah, but but I just have to ask Sharon. Don't don't you have a book of essays about aging as well? Oh, indeed, my essays are going to be out at the latest. I think next spring with Freeann Books. Um, it's called "This Strange Visible Air: Ages on Essays on Aging and the Writing Life." Mm -hmm. And I'm just finished up the revisions of the editing and sent them back. And now I wrote one. 27 page essay that we all agree is crap so I'm now trying to rewrite it in 10 or 12 pages and to figure out you know get past the the details like for since a girl I went to high school with was murdered when she was 23 just turned 23 and I was still 22 and so that was 1962. So this has been something in my life all the way up until 1998 when I started asking questions. And it's now been 60 years, just about 59 years since she was killed. And I spent since 1998 to, my book was published in 2008. So I don't know, a long time asking questions, thinking about her and all the rest of it. And so now I'm trying to get past all the detail, mountains of detail and ideas to say, what was this all about? You know, that's what I'm trying to do right now and hope to have done by the end of the week. Ha ha, not a chance. But. <laughs> well, honestly, you are, uh, you are amazingly prolific. I salute you. Um, my pandemic, um, one thing I've, you know, the, the bookstore uh, is blessed with uh, very bright, capable young staff. You met two of them at the beginning and, and they did an amazing pivot and really uh, the bookstore has thrived. So what I have trouble with is the sort of undemocraticness of, of the suffering, you know, that, you know, like, like people who, theater artists are, you know, it's just, it's, it just, it's kind of hard to, um, to feel okay with how un, unevenly the misery has been distributed, you know, um, that's, that's one thing that's been on my mind lately. Um, I uh, I used to be a total maniac, flinging myself about all the time, and um, I've slowed down incredibly. Um, I used to think that I didn't have time to wash lettuce, so that I had to buy pre-washed lettuce. And in fact, I do have time to wash lettuce. <laughs> and this 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 has been a revelation. It's, it's been wonderful. But the best thing, the best thing that I have discovered in the pandemic is that um, my, I, I'm, I'm getting old, my eyes are crummy, and um, I really like reading at bedtime. I like to finish my work for the day and read at bedtime. And, um, but I find that, uh, particularly with all the time I'm spending on screens, I have terrible eye strain, and in the evenings, my eyes are too tired to read. And I hate watching TV. I hate, like, I just hate, you know, scrolling through Netflix and going, oh, you know, how can I waste another hour of my life on this stuff? So I discovered audiobooks. And, and my son, my rotten son, who never calls and never, you know, um, he, got me, he got me a Bluetooth speaker. And I signed up not for Audible, because that's Amazon, and we do not put another nickel in Jeff Bezos' pocket. So I found a, a non-Amazon audiobooks provider. And now, in the evenings, I make myself a cup of tea, 
I sit in my favorite chair in front of the fire and I turn on my Bluetooth speaker and I listen to a book for two hours with no strain on my eyes whatsoever. And it's uh, fabulous. <laughs> Great. Well, I'd love it if people would put in the comments things that you've been doing over the pandemic as well because i think lots of people have have made interesting shifts and there's lots we can learn from each other from that so how about you larissa could you unmute yourself and tell us how your pandemic year has gone sure i mean i'm just conscious of spending so much well i'm with totally with joanne on the there's been so much time on screen and it's really really hard on the body so I hear you, Joanne, on, you know, not want, wanting to watch TV. I end up doing it anyway because I just, I can't read. Like, my eyes are just so done by the end of the day. Um, what have I been doing? I, I mean, I'm, I'm caretaking my, my elderly parents as well. Um, I managed to get them both here from Vancouver. And so, I mean, a big part of the early part of the pandemic was struggle for groceries while trying to stay, you know, like to avoid contact because um, I'm, I'm terrified that they're going to catch it. I think I've become a little bit agoraphobic. Like the last couple of days I've had to go out. Mom had a, had to go to the to a little dental emergency. And um, so we had to, and my dentist in the malls, so we had to go to the mall. And I it just freaked me right out to see the way some folks are just like going more or less going about their daily as though this weren't happening. And um I think I have become quite agoraphobic, but for the most part, I've been able to, and I feel so fortunate in that kind of way. Um, I have been able to largely avoid uh, physical contact with other humans, but I also know that that can't be good, you know, in, a, in another way, like that's really not good. Um, so there is definitely a sort of a strangeness of the, of our, the sociality of COVID is really weird, really, really, really weird. Um, totally with you, Joanne, on being so worried about the folks around me. One of the things that I've been doing quite a bit is getting, um, like ordering groceries in sort of ridiculously vast amounts, so I don't have to do it very often. Um, and I do it, I order pickup and then I go to the grocery store and I park my car and each week it's a different lovely young person loading my car. I feel guilty about it. Um, but then by the same token, I also know that if I were to go into the grocery store and bring the bug home to my folks, um, I couldn't forgive myself. So I, I have been thinking about those young people and my students as well and continuing um, I was lucky to be on leave in the first part of um, of, of, of COVID. And now I'm back at work. Um, but I also work with a lot of young people. I worry about them. They don't have, you know, they don't have the same kind of padding that I, that I do. They have to go out in the world for various things. Um, one of my students just, um, the, uh, the, um, the pipes of their apartment burst this week while they're in the middle of a very stressful period. And, you know, so I... I worry about the young folks. I worry about the folks working in the meat packing plants. I worry about the folks in the care homes, both the, the elderly people who live there and the workers. I worry about my own folks. I've been worried a lot worried, I think. Uh, and then there's been the strange spatiality of Zoom. So I have been able to attend events all over the world without having to fly, which has been wonderful. Um, but also weird because the presence of you all on zoom fabulous though it is is not the same as seeing you in person so things have shifted distance means less um but the physicality of people means more it's very strange i'm finding it very strange i yeah i'll probably have a lot more to say about it once we're vaccinated and out in the world again and like when i come out of hiding yeah maybe, i'll probably be understand it better yeah I know what that means. Mm. How about you, Michelle? How has your year been? <laughs> Just to be as weird as I usually am, the pandemic has been one of the best years of my life. <laughs> 
so far. Um, my book came out in the spring of 2020, and it has done really well in terms of my objectives with the book. And uh, um, and I had just come to a, a a point of where I was trying to organize my life in a way that I could um, still use my law degree without having to practice law. So I work as an adjudicator with a couple of uh, provincial tribunals. And so all of my work is from home. I get big boxes of documents and I hold hearings and I also write decisions based on uh, the record, just documents. And I'm working on a new book and, uh, and it just, I know it sounds terrible because of course I think about vulnerable populations, um, you know, not the least of which is indigenous populations where overcrowding on reserves is so um, endemic that, you know, the likelihood of uh, cross contamination and infection is much higher. And there's been some evidence that, and I suppose it's not surprising that, you know, people with uh, more challenges on a socioeconomic basis are going to be more impacted by the virus than others that can afford um, solitude. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, but it's been a really good year for me, really productive year. It's been good in terms of structuring my life. And like I've been saying to others, you know, I'm such a solitary person. I feel like I've been training for this pandemic all my life. <laughs> so I'm here. If anybody needs some cheering up about being by yourself, I'm here. <laughs> Absolutely. Isolation, so... Has the pandemic changed how you think about aging? Does it put it in a different light? Well, certainly, I, here we go. The long-term care uh, homes, um, appalling catastrophe has brought home, I would hope, to everyone that that is really the end result of ageism. When ageism goes that far, what we have are people dying the way we all know, which I won't repeat. Certainly thought about that and read a considerable bit of uh, people writing about it. Um, as for myself, of course, I've always uh, dreaded the thought that someday I might wind up in a place like that. I don't know anyone who's dying to go there, actually. Um, but, you know, when you're alone, my husband is dead. Uh, two of my four sisters are dead and the other two are incapacitated. Parents long gone. Uh, son and family way out in Ontario. Uh, I, I'm aware, very aware now, especially aware, that uh, I have got to figure out how to look after myself in those, you know, like I'm fine right now. I'm even just yesterday, a clerk, asked me very politely if I was lying when I told her I was 80, which I had to say because of what I was buying, you know. But this is not going to last, folks. <laughs> you know, the hair color and everything is going to... I'm going to look my age any day now. And when that happens, heaven help me. But I, I... I feel calmer and more peaceful about it. I think that's the effect of not being out in the world all the time and constantly having to um, right. be strong, you know, in the face of the way that people ignore you. And, uh, you know, because most people who are working are young people, you know. Um, and, and becoming closer and more intimate with the people I am able to see. I think that's about it. Well, I can always talk more, but people don't always want to listen, so. We'll get back to you again. <laughs> Meantime, Joanne, what are you thinking about it? Everybody. Oh, Lord. Or did it even um, cross your mind? Pardon me? Did it even cross your mind? Aging. Yeah, I, I don't know. There, there, 
I, I'm I'm single. I, I I live alone, and I have for years. And um, as a as a single woman, I had a life that was um, quite well organized to provide just the right amount of uh, social interaction, and uh, you know, and hugs and uh, physical contact with people, and um, and losing that has been quite painful, you know, because, because for, uh, for a single person, um, uh, you know, having, having all, uh, all contact, all face-to-face -face contact with people disappear, it's, um, it's hard. It's really hard. I remember um, my son and his partner, I keep, yeah, he's, he, he's obviously a better kid than I make him out to be. They came over for a visit in my garden in the summer. And I looked at these two young people sitting side by side. And I said to them, oh, you're so close together. You know, <laughs> you know, because I, I have to be physically distant from everybody, you know, uh, and um, Mm -hmm. So being physically apart from everybody, I have found, uh, you know, I, I was kind of walking a line before and um, yeah, it's, uh, it was, it's, it was, it was hard. It was painful to lose the physical presence of people in my life. Yes. I hear you on that. How about you, Larissa? I mean, one of the things that the pandemic really has, you know, brought home for me is a sense of my own mortality. I've been, always, I've been feeling that anyway. I, I struggle with um, some, some chronic pain stuff that um, is exacerbated by sitting. So, and, you know, because there's been so much, I mean, I'm always in a chair, even before the pandemic, you know, it's hard to not be on the computer when you're a writer and an academic. Um, but so that stuff, you know, and then combined with, you know, knowing people who have caught it um, and then just reading the news, watching the TV and seeing, you know, how fragile life is. I am um, quite aware of my own mortality. I mean, I feel like, you know, I still have a bit of time. Um, so I'm not like, oh my goodness, I think it's going to happen tomorrow, but it could. I don't think so, but mm -hmm. I, I'm just aware that it's finite and that there are, there are things that I need to do. And um, it makes me, it's maybe actually quite um, protective of my own time. I've becoming, I'm becoming more impatient with, you know, garbage and um, impatient with things that I must do that I don't think matter because there are things that do matter. And mm -hmm. I just, I really feel, yeah, I really feel I need to get to them. So there's that. And then for sure, thinking about the care homes in particular, you know, because mom and dad are with me and I have other relatives as well who are, are having a harder time of it. And um, it makes me think about, you know, my own moment as well. and what to do. I don't have a strong sense of being able to rely on the systems that exist. My friends and I, since we've been we're in our 20s, have talked about having an old lady house together. And so I think about that Baba, Yaga, that Baba Yaga project, I think that started in Paris. I think there's one in Toronto now. I think about that a lot as a way possibly to do it because it's horrible. It's just so upsetting. Sounds like a plan. Michelle, what are you thinking, feeling about aging these days? Or have you had time to think about it? I have. <laughs> because I too live alone and it's the pandemic. I'm not going anywhere. So one of the things I actually notice is that I, um, uh, is I socialize more than I thought I did. Right. It's, uh, you know, I think of myself as a very solitary person, but now that I'm being very strict about not being in the company of others, I realize how much I did socialize in my own unique kind of way. And, uh, but I also have, um, 
I have a very active list of things that I want to do before I die. And uh, my, my son passed away, my only child, in 2013 while I was working on this book that took me nine years. All you prolific writers, I'm so jealous. <laughs> um, but it changed my entire perspective on living and aging. And, um, and I, I lost all fear of my last day on earth. And so I don't, I don't look at old age with dread. Um, I look at it in terms of doing everything I can to be independent as long as possible because I won't be going anywhere other than my own home. And so if I have to take matters into my old hands, into my own hands, they'll be old hands too, um, then I will because I'm not, I think that the way we uh, dispose of elderly people in this society is just hideous and um, contrary to any sense of being human and social and engaged with each other, any sense of, you know, family and linkages and so on. Um, but for me, it's different because I am really solitary in the world, no kids, no family. So it's kind of a, but I've got some specific things to accomplish before I, before I dance off and join my kid. But yeah. So <laughs> I guess thinking about it in terms of those objectives and, and being fit enough to meet those objectives within whatever time I've got left. There's apparently longevity in my family. Huh. Well, one last quick question. What, what are the books you've got coming out next? Joanne? Oh, yeah, I'm working on my third novel. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm working with a mentor at the Humber Writing School and um, just, uh, it's coming along very well. I think it, uh, it might, you know, it might not take 15 years like the last one. I might have this sucker ready to go in two years. So, uh, and I can't tell you the title because it changes weekly, but it's, uh, it's a novel and uh, I'm excited about it and it's going well. Wonderful. Karen? Well, it's um, The Strange Visible Air Essays on Aging and the yeah. Writing Life, but I have two other right. completed novels um, that we're kind of waiting till the essays are out before we start worrying about the other two. Mm. And both Sharon and Joanne, you have a chapter coming out in a book on Rona's Anthology on you aging. You look, good for your age. Yeah. you look good for you your look age. Good for your age. You look yeah. good for your age. Yes. So I'll send everybody a link for the launch, which is coming up fairly soon. In the roundup email, I'll send you information about Great. that book and, uh, and the launch. Larissa, how about you? You've got one too. I have exciting news to share. I, I have a poetry book that um, officially releases on uh, March the 2nd, but it's actually just come off the press. And so I can show it to you, just come back from the press. It's nice. called Iron Goddess of Mercy. It's, uh, it's a long poem in 64 fragments. I'm working on a novel as well. I've just completed a, a draft and uh, I have a collection of, of essays. Um, in the works that has been in the works since the sort of, you know, about 2010 or so. I don't know if, when that one will come out, but those are other projects on the back burner. Wonderful. Michelle, what are you working on? Boy. <laughs> well, I'm working on a core collection of poems that I'm writing right now, but I'm also working on a new novel, um, which is again, um, historical in nature. I'm taking a particular time in in history in Canada in what used to be the Northwest Territories, which is Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and looking at um, a particular event in history, but looking at it through the eyes of a woman of my great grandmother's ancestry and how she would have ex how she would have experienced those things um, as compared to the way those things are um, 
articulated in history books. And so it's, uh, it's a real challenge because there's some, um, you know, historical events that you really can't mess around with. <laughs> so there's a, there's a ton of research with it, which has been, this has been a good time for that because I can do most of the research online. And I got a couple of chapters down, so we'll see. We'll see how long it takes, but it just, I don't think I've got another nine years for per novel, I have to, I have to get moving along quicker than that. So, mm -hmm. well, I wish you lots and lots of it, and look forward to seeing it when it's ready. So, I just want to thank you all for being so open with us and um, sharing your lives, your stories, your books, and um, I will send up that roundup email. And hopefully we can all stay a little more in touch. Sure. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thank you also, uh, Sharon, Joanne, Michelle, and Larissa. That was wonderful. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I got out of this is to immediately call my mom when I go home. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and, um, well... I got to say, though, I'm, uh, as the weather is improving, uh, I am playing. I'm looking forward to having some walks with my, with my parents. They've been, they've been doing that uh, a lot these days, and I'm excited to join them soon. Um, so I posted in the chat there a link where all the books are available. Uh, we do have them all here in store. And we are doing a free delivery within Calgary with a minimum purchase. Um, also, um, as Larissa mentioned, she is launching her uh, her new book of poetry actually with us. That'll be on March 16th with uh, Leo Horlick. So that's going to be an exciting event. I think it will be really fun. And uh, also, we have that Rona Altro's uh, ed uh, edited that uh, anthology, which will be coming out I think in the end at the end of May. So we've got that scheduled for May 27th. But I think there'll be um, you can keep an eye on our uh, events page or at our, on our website or on our Facebook page as well for news about that. So um, yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for all the speakers and thank you, Lynn. And uh, everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks to all of you. Thank Thanks, you, Jean. Jean. Thanks, Lynn. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Jean. That was great. Bye-bye. Really enjoyed Thanks, it. Everyone. Yeah, Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.